So next up, we've got um, Paul Jupp, um, who's going to talk to us about uh, the um, meadow in my garden and the, the magic of flower meadows and gardens in community spaces. Uh, welcome, Paul. Hello, everyone. So yeah, um, I'm Paul Jupp. Uh, meadow in my garden uh, is a uh, community interest company that I've been running now for 12 years. And we specialize in the creation of flower meadows from seed. Um, our particular interest is, is, is biodiversity. Um, I think we all know just how much na our nature is in trouble. Um, has anyone here been watching The Wild Isles, the latest uh, David Attenborough series? It's been wonderful. Interestingly, um, there was some research commissioned for that series. There's a new campaign, Saving Our Wild Isles, sponsored by the RSPB. And there was a YouGov poll um, looking into people's perceptions. And unsurprisingly, three quarters of the population are very aware that our nature is in trouble. Um, Two-thirds of those polled, I think it was 68%, um, felt that the government wasn't doing nearly enough um, to address the situation. But what was really surprising for me was that 55%, more than half of the people polled, felt that the situation in the UK was at least as good as the rest of the world, or better. And that was surprising because many of you here today will know that we are world leaders in nature depletion. And we're in the bottom 10% of the table. We're 189th out of 218 countries for how we look after our nature. So everything that I try to do is really f keeps that very much forefront of our minds. You know, what do we do about how do you remain hopeful um, in the face of ecological devastation, really? And it's, so there is something really magical about the power of flowers really to, you know, they're, they're, they're seductive. And, and a lot of the change that I've seen in running this for 12 years has been this, this unbelievable beauty of, of these meadows. Um, much of our work, I mean, it's nice when we have the, that's better, uh, it's nice when we have the, the space to, to really show off. But much of our work is much more this sort of thing where we're trying to find little patches of unloved land that we can fill with flower, fill with colour for the benefit of pollinators. And these are very typical little examples of, uh, of spaces that can be very easily brought to life, often with the help of volunteer groups um, all around. I mean, I've been based around Wiltshire for 30 years, so much of our work focuses here but we are now reaching out across the whole of the UK in doing this kind of work. Um, we are, I like to call myself an evangelist for nature, if it's not too grand. So we, we're, we're constantly trying to think about you know, how, how, do we, how do we get people to realise this is really an emergency and we all need to act. And so we're giving a lot of talks um, up and down the country. We create flower meadows at various um, gardens, we're just doing one at the RHS gardens in Rosemore, um, and there we can educate and explain to people what we're doing. Um, and you'll see just outside there, we have a stall. This is what we do. So we do dozens and dozens of different packs of seed, different uh, plant mixtures, communities of plants designed to perform in, in any and every kind of garden to start with. Um, whether you've got a garden which is full of sun or whether you've got shady, difficult little patches, we can always find a community of plants that will do well. Um, it's worth just sort of for context, really. A lot of my gardening style has been influenced by the wider landscape. And we're lucky here in Wiltshire to have some of the best native wildflower meadows uh, certainly in the country, of international acclaim as well. Um, if you go just up the road, sort of 10, 20 miles, you'll see Clattinger Farm in Malmesbury, and then further up the road, North Meadow in uh, Cricklade. And these are some of the finest examples of a landscape 
which was once um, much more common. Um, a lot of these wildflower meadows have declined uh, in extent by around 97%. Uh, it's really quite incredible how much has been lost. Um, certainly in, in my grandparents' childhoods, these would have been very commonplace. And you can imagine the sort of clouds of butterflies ascending from the, the flowery undergrowth, inspiring artists and poets. Um, some of the best meadows, and these are the first flowers that you will see. Sadly, this year, and we would usually be visiting the meadows at uh, Cricklade around now, but I see they're closed because of excessive rainfall um, until about the 19th of May. So everything's been set back due to you know, some fairly significant climate issues that we're facing. But the fritillaries, for me, are particularly magical. And, and there's something... I mean, there's 80% of the UK's fritillaries exist here on our doorstep. It's 110 acres of, of, of flower meadows. Really quite incredible. Um, the white one, these are ghostly. Um, and uh, when you see them en masse, it really is a, a, a spectacle. And these then make way for um, a, a, an amazing habitat. It's reckoned that in every acre of these native wildflower meadows, um, you, you will get up to about three million flowers emerging every day. And that's enough to feed close to 100,000 bees and other pollinators. Um, so um, they're, they're very significant and very important. And we've lost a lot of it, as we know. Um, and it's important, not just because of the beauty of the flower, but the habitats these are creating for such a wide range of, uh, of, of pollinators. This is the buff-tailed bumblebee. Just wanted to give you a few examples. Um, these are all examples of greetings cards that we have for sale as well, if you want to have a, come and have a look afterwards. <laughs> uh, these are orange-tipped butterflies, the male on the right there, and then we've got the green fritillary butterfly. And when we travel up and down the country doing, we do about 20 garden shows a year. Um, and it's, it's not unusual that people say to us, what's happening with our, with our insects? We're not getting nearly so many insects. Um, and this issue of where, you know, it seems to have all happened very quickly. Um, certainly I think of it in terms of my, you know, my lifetime, you know, from the age of, 10, when I first took a re an interest in, uh, particularly in ornithology at that time. Um, fast forward to 2010, and I read the Living Planet report, where more than half the world's wildlife had gone in, in, in that time. Um, there was a study last year, which was sponsored by the charity Bug Life, called Bugs Matter. And they measure the extent of our insect loss at close to 60% in 20 years. So we're losing insects at a rate of about a third a decade, just to put it in perspective. And make no mistake, these are the fellows that run the planet, you know. Um, yeah, well, th these things are never monocausal, but, but the, the, the start point for me is, is agricultural. So why on earth we think we can grow um, healthy, nutritious foods dowsing the land with a cocktail of toxic chemicals. You know? and, and we're becoming more and more aware of the power of these things. If you look at the latest um, poisons that we spray on the land in huge number, um, huge quantities, the uh, neonicotinoids are 10,000 times more toxic than DDT. Um, it took us till 1986 to ban DDT in this country. It's now exported to other parts of the world. Um, but the neonicotinoid, 10,000 times more potent, one teaspoon of, of, of uh, neonicotinoid is enough to kill one and a half billion bees, you know. So that's the start point, is it's intensive agriculture. Um, another thing is... You know, I often talk about the value of gardens because we're lucky in this country. We are a nation. We're recognised around the world as being a nation of garden lovers. And 
Um, if you look at all the garden space put together, there's about a million acres of gardens in the UK. It's four and a half times greater than all of our nature reserves. So if we think of our gardens as little mini nature reserves, there's a lot we can do. But there ain't a lot you can do in these kind of gardens, you know. Um, and you know, it might be a start point, putting some holes in the fences for hedgehogs, you know. Um, but you do see all kinds of possibility. You know, when you put your mind to it, a small fence garden like that, when you go upwards, you can pack an awful lot in. Um, so, but I think, um, you know, you, you, you certainly have the impact of intensive agriculture, number one, the spread of urbanization, and then I think just general neglect. And people are just, even now, um, people are, the awareness is only just starting. Um, a lot of people are now thinking about providing habitats, and, and you see a lot of these bug houses. You can buy them in Waitrose, you know, as, as, and they're, they're useful. But one of the things I always say is that, you know, putting one up without planting flowers is like a hotel without a, a restaurant, you know. Um, and you can't expect that they're going to do all the work. So this is very typical of the sort of thing that we're doing, just to be clear. So I'm selling lots and lots of little bags of seed containing largely annual and perennial species, which you might sow in a garden situation as a start point in a border. This is a typical, the north, in the north of England. In the spring, this would have been a bare earth border, sown in April. You're seeing the picture here in July. So they grow incredibly quickly. And the idea is to provide a succession of flowers for about four months in the first season. Very beautiful, very easy to do, and fantastically beneficial as a food source for, uh, for insects. And there's lots of, just give you some examples, really, of, of what you can do in the garden. So those people that say, well, you know, I haven't got a garden or I've only got a tiny patch, you can do it in pots, in troughs, um, in, in window boxes. There's no space which isn't valuable. Um, and lovely little patches like this. And I was so touched. This was a picture sent to me by a lady who bought some seeds at a Christmas market from me. And it was a gift for her six-year-old granddaughter. So this was the first garden experience of a little six-year-old girl. You know, and you kind of think that's going to stay with you in life, those sorts of experiences. As easy as just getting your hands in the seed, scattering it on the soil and waiting to see what happens. It's powerful. It's magical. So a lot of our technique, and I'll go through a few different... You can come and talk to me in more detail about how, the how to do it, because there's not enough time. Um, but typically, if we want to really show off, we would remove the competition. So we're here I've turf-stripped, and I've already sown the seed, and we're rolling it. But this is what would happen from sowing in the spring by the summer in the first season. An absolute array of the most wonderful flowers. And it is this, I always say the beauty of it is a byproduct. The real value, when you close your eyes, is to listen to the insects uh, buzzing all around. Uh, so they have the power to transform and to change the way we think about nature. And we can't look after nature unless we have first learned to love it. Uh, and this thing about people say, well, I haven't got space for a, a meadow. You know, it, it, we're really only talking about different communities of plants. We can't think of a better name for it, really. I mean, we are working with native grassland meadow creation, but a lot of it is, is something else. Um, it's a new gardening technique, great for novice gardeners and for experts. And you can just take a little patch like that and fill it with low-cost... Um, flowers. There's also things that if you've already got, if your garden's committed, which often people say, oh, well, you know, no space left, I'm afraid, you could think about sowing seeds in amongst the herbaceous border. So in your rose beds, fill the space between the roses with a mixture of seeds which is low growing, highly scented, good for aphid control, protecting the soils. So it does a lot of, it's not just about the flowers, it's also about working with nature to enhance the natural balance in the garden. Uh, this is another natural balance. If you had a vegetable garden, you wouldn't find a better mix 
to control aphid populations. So it's as well as uh, attracting the aphids away from the vegetables, it then attracts all of the predators, the lacewings, the hoverflies, the um, ladybird larvae particularly, the para all the parasitic wasps, you know, all, they're all useful. People say to me, what's the point of a wasp? Can you explain to me? You know, what are wasps for? You know, fantastic aphid control, uh, and they're great for pollination as well, actually, but, you know, got a bit of an attitude, which is, can be a problem, but... Um, and here is a perfect example, just because it's a bit wild, it doesn't have to be, um, you can still design the garden. So at the front of this border we've used an extra short mixture and it only grows about 20 centimetres in height. So you see you, you can still, yeah, you can go a bit wilder without losing design altogether. Um, this is one we call under the wall, great under dry stone walls in gravelly soils, you get the idea. So different aspects, different soil types, different heights, different colour palettes. And, and this is, when I see this, I see it as a huge opportunity just to educate people that we, we don't have to accept these monocultures. There seems to me to be no purpose for that lawn at all. You're not going to be sitting out on it. Um, and next door there, um, taking a different approach, and this is, this is actually a dwarf annual mixture, just really thinking of it as a one-year flower crop, if you like. Um, and this is where it starts, you know, scattering the seed in amongst the area. Within two to three weeks, you see the first signs of emerging life. And then uh, seven, eight weeks later, it's in full flower. And, and of course, you, know, you can still find space for inevitably you've got to put, put the car somewhere but it doesn't the cars don't have to totally dominate every single space and this is one we developed for under tree planting so this is a dwarf ground cover mixture designed for dry situations shady dry you know typical tree roots tend to make it difficult to cultivate the soil. And where it's so useful, you know, for biodiversity, but this is what happens, this is actually from devices. Um, because the constant strimming of the grass inevitably damages the trees, and these trees are destined to die very soon if that continues. Um, and alternatively, you can just create a nice wild border underneath, a biodiversity border. And it only needs cutting once a year. Um, typically, you cut back um, at the end of the year when the flowering cycle has completed. Uh, October is usually the best month. Um, it could be later, but if you cut it in October, it also helps the meadow because in the second year, you're going to get perennial flowers. So we're looking at opening it up for perennial growth in the second year. And that can be sown either in the spring or in the autumn. September, October can be quite a good time to sow. Um, just wanted to um, move on to some of our projects. So we start in our immediate environment with this idea we can all do something. You know, we can't solve all the problems of the world, but we can all sow some flowers or plant a tree or do something. And what happens working in your immediate environment is you soon realise that we can start to look beyond our garden gate. You know, why not? You know, why not just kind of take over a patch of unloved land, you know, talk to the council maybe, but let's just do it. You know, it's an emergency. This was something we did down in Plymouth uh, year before last, partnering with the charity Bug Life and with City Council, uh, Plymouth City Council. Um, so it shows what can be, you know, you don't get, it seems quite out of place, doesn't it, to see colour in the middle of a town or a city. Um, but we did a couple of these big areas. Um, you'll have seen recently that Plymouth have removed 117 trees from the centre of the, you know, it's just, just awful and we've got to focus our attention on these things. And this wasn't one of our projects, but I put it in because it's, it's, um, it's up in um, Huddersfield and it's the central reservation. It goes on for six miles and they filled it with flour and they reckon it saved them about £20,000 in mowing costs in its first year. So it's incredible, you know, and it's been very, very well received. It certainly improves your drive to work in the morning. Um, just imagine sitting next to that. So, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Would that be self-maintained? Would it come back year after year after 
Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what was done there. So the council might take the view that it's worth doing it as an annual treatment. So with the annual only, um, that was a Pictorial Meadows project, and a lot of their seeds are annual only. We would certainly, as a recommendation, go for annual and perennial mixtures, which means that you're certain to get at least two years. Um, and I'll come on to some examples of where we've seen five or six years of, it depends how well it's managed, in all honesty. Um, and this is one we sponsored, we, sent, we donated some seeds up to um, Todd Morden. And um, I just like the fact that we're, for me, it's, you know, once you start creating these little patches, there's then the opportunity to join them up with, with little, little uh, B roads, you know, little wildlife corridors that join these up and give you the sense that we, this could start to feel like we're making some, some progress. Um, typical little patch, I'm always on the lookout for these. This is outside our village shop in Freshford. And it becomes, you can see how quickly it, it was, people were starting to drive across it so it's all compacted. And we managed to get agreement to fill that with flowers last year. Very, very easy to do. Um, but then what happens very quickly, <laughs> so this is, you know, they, the bin, they, re, they replace the bin with an even bigger bin. And then next to the bin, we've now got a grit bin, massive great thing, which will need to be removed by cover of darkness, I can assure you. But it's, look at it. And, but you look at this, and honestly, I despair. You know, this is just further up the road in Limpley Stoke. That do we have to pave over every little bit of space? There's just no point, you know, in tarmacking over. I had this, this was a, I had in mind for a beautiful flower meadow border. They've gone and that, and I'm going to need to get a pneumatic drill now to deal with this. It's just... Um, so all over the place, and this is um, the Freshford Station that we manage with a group of volunteers. That little patch in the middle there, we uh, cleared and uh, scattered with seeds last year. And I was just amazed at how much people are delighted by it. You know, it's, it's, it really makes a difference. Uh, there you go. So there's lots of these little groups that we're busy sponsoring. And if you have, please come and talk to me. Contact us via the website. We're looking for people that could make some of these things, community groups, gardens, church groups. Um, you know, let's get the kids involved. It's really easy to do. Uh, this was the D Devices Clean Up, Clean Up Devices Squad, the CUDS. And here we um, took over a couple of roundabouts. This is... Very easily done, a bit of careful um, preparation of the soil. But this was year one in 2016, and this roundabout has been every year. It changes every year, and you do different things. We add plug plants, we underplant with bulbs. But you see, it keeps changing. It keeps, you see so much insect life in these, uh, in these little patches. This was another roundabout further down the road very different soil, different aspect. And we sowed that one with um, another dwarf mixture around this rowan tree in the middle. Uh, this is the flowering succession that you see right the way through the year. Again, lots and lots of insects. And then at the end of the year, this is this business of, well, how is it maintained? We're fundamentally looking at once a year, getting onto the roundabout disturbance, all flowering succession is, is dependent on some kind of animal disturbance. Uh, cuds are as good as anything else. You know, clearing, rooting around a bit, removing unwanted or, or greedy vegetation uh, and cutting back. Um, this was the roundabout in the third year. We'd added some alliums in the middle and some of this beautiful um, dwarf flowers around the outside. Um, Phacelia in the middle, and if you know that, any bee keepers here will know Phacelia. It's a real bee magnet. And then, again, as I say, joining up these little patches with, with you know, things that will work in dry cracks and crevices um, in all kinds of situations. Now, this was, again, our village in Freshford, and we, we took two sets of pictures. This was one uh, last June where we've been trying to just encourage all this spontaneous vegetation and add seeds in here and there. But on the same day, um, 
this was the scene of devastation where somebody had actually taken a, a spray to the, you know, a glyphosate Roundup spray. And this is often considered a tidier approach, you know, let's just get rid of all the greenery. Um, so this is what we're up, we're up against. And I feel very strongly now that we have to stand up against, you know, you see these advertising campaigns where we're waging war on dandelions, you know, um, and uh, we can't allow them to exist. Um, and you see the shelves of supermarkets full of, of these toxins, which are a known carcinogen and have all sorts of uh, health effects. They shouldn't be used at all. Um, Plant Life have been very successfully promoting this Nomo May campaign. This is a really good place to start. Just easing up, you know, leaving the mower in the shed at least for May and maybe beyond, and then seeing what happens. It's really um, what's, what you start to see once you leave the grass is that there's a lot more going on and there are all sorts of species that may be just waiting for their opportunity um, to emerge. And that often just needs regular, initially regular mowing and clearing so that we don't put fertility back into the soil. Um, and this we see spreading up and down the country with various groups. This is up in Birmingham, in the centre of Birmingham, where we're working with a group called the Patchwork Meadow. This idea of just little patches, even a square metre at a time. And um, little spaces like this. This was a project in Devizes. As you can see, this is just pure sand. And we found a mixture that would work very well there. So this is, you know, so often we're looking at these green deserts, I would call it. This sort of what we, what we refer to as amenity grassland. And it's become the norm, looking at this, that the council keep it nice and tidy. And they think that's what people want. And, and here you see, you know, the, the only colour to be seen, the, the hive is of the guy with the blowvac, you know. Um, so this was a, a group, in fact, it was the view from where I used to live in Devizes, and the neighbours got together to create a, a beautiful, just turn it back into a garden. And there's a number of techniques that we use. Firstly, working with the council, talking about how we can change the mowing regime. Not mowing all of it, just mowing artful paths through it, letting the, letting the grassland express itself. All these beautiful grasses, lots of surprises. Orchids in the first year, you know. Um, and, and a lot of the time we're just, again, doing what grazing animals would do, scratching up the surface to remove about 50% of the grass and then sow native wildflowers. And in other areas, um, yeah, so there's this idea of little pathways through and you can then introduce uh, trees into the space. Uh, here we've got a little mini orchard all planted by the community with the council. And then a big circle of oak trees on the other side of that green. Uh, bulb planting is also important, you know, I think as, in terms of a way to get the community involved. Here on this project we planted 10,000 native daffodil bulbs in one day in October a couple of years ago. And um, a 600 metre strip all the way along next to the pathway. Uh, and uh, this is another technique which is, you know, so it's not all about the seeds, it's about all of these things we can do coming together as communities. And this chap on the left is a mate of mine who runs a business called Garden on a Roll, which is like a planting by numbers system. So um, this is something we're working with all sorts of groups, particularly in schools, um, because it's as easy, you know, you just lay down this paper template and you get the plant in the right place first time. Um, and then within about a year, the nice, healthy plants have all matured and filled the border space. It's a really good technique. Then back to seed sowing, this was the same, the same park where we prepared the ground again, cleared the ground very carefully, and sowed various different mixtures. Um, just wanted to show you this, because it does show you this flowering succession. So we're, what we're seeing here is the first flowers emerging in late June. You then see uh, July, August, September, still flowering, but changing all the time. 
And then even as late as this was November, and the cosmos is still hanging on in there. And then we left it till the following year to cut it back. Cutting involves strilling or scything, quite is nice, but any way you like of removing the, uh, the growth, taking it away, and, um, and then... Yeah, yeah. if you leave it too late, it can all start, and it needs opening up. So often October is the best time. I always struggle because I don't like cutting flowers down, and if things are still in flower. But usually about October is the best time, and then the perennials will have already established. Um, and um, just to finish, you know, the, the, my thought process is that the, the truth is that every one of us you know, who, whoever we are, wherever we live, can and, and must now make a difference, you know, to this, to this state of this state of nature in this country, around the world. But we are, as I said, we're world leaders in nature depletion. We've got to do something about it. And I feel that part of it also is making nature a normal part of childhood again. Um, and and so that so that we're we're feeling that we're leaving our natural world in a better state for for coming generations. Um, so thank thanks for listening. Um, I've got probably five minutes for some questions. Um, if you have anything you'd like to ask, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> there's, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, there's no best. It's really what is appropriate, and there are two ends of a spectrum. One of which is to try to um, uh, replace. Um, existing communities of plants and the other is more of a sort of preservation or a conservation approach so a lot of what we would pr promote is about changing the mowing regime uh, and always removing so that we're not just dumping grass on top of the uh, on, on, on top of grassland um, and in most cases that's beneficial where I think this idea of, I mean, it's horticultural, really. So we're looking at areas where we can create a bed of soil uh, and find a community of plants that will give us the best succession and the, and the best value for money and the lowest maintenance and the best, co the, the, the best we can do for um, coping with climate change because watering is becoming a big issue. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. I think thank you, that's a lovely question. I, I think it's so often a start point. is when you go on an estate, and certainly with some older estates, there are lots of little green places that often people feel they need to tidy. You know, we, we don't have the language in a way to know what could be done. But I think as a... Sorry, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I would say a good start point is contact me via the website.
And our start point has been quite often to create a plan. Um, a, um, I'll go back to here. <laughs> I felt I had an unfair advantage over you, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, start with a, with a really well thought through plan of action. What could be done immediately? Bulbs are always a great start point. Um, but there needs to be probably a, a five-year plan um, and then work with the community with the, to get, get a feeling for what they, and then talk to the council. All of that sort of needs to be joined up. Um, but it, I always start with those places. There is so much opportunity for, opportunity for tree planting, fruit trees, um, just absolutely, as you say, crying out. The land is crying out for, for, for that sort of attention. Um, so it's um, just, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks for listening. Come and see me on the stall. Take a card and, and then, you know, we, obviously detailed conversations can happen after these things, but hopefully that resonates, some of that. Um, I think Chippenham might be falling behind as well with other count, you know, we're noticing Khan are doing wonderful things, Devizes, Melksham doing great things, Bradford on Avon. I mean, just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.